Hey, we're live. Okay. Hey, everybody. Live. Hi. Welcome to uh, the latest <clears throat> Cabin Fever chat with toughpigs.com. Uh, my name is Joe Hennis. I'm joined right there. I got the pointer in the right direction by my good friend Ryan Rowe. Hey, Ryan. Hello. And uh, we are being joined by the guy who wrote this book. It's the Jim, Jim Henson biography. His name is Brian J. Jones. He's hey, down Brian. there. There you are. Hey guys, they're about to have to work Muppet style. It's reversed. Oh, back hard? Right. How do they do that? I'll never get used to it. I don't know. No, I don't know. Uh, Jim always said that was super easy, and Jerry, Jerry Joel said, "No, it's not." <laughs> I don't feel like it's it's like once you like there's like a moment that clicks as a puppeteer, where it's like it's impossible, it's impossible, it's impossible, and then suddenly, like, how did I ever do this without? Like, how do Is you it like the like the Malcolm Gladwell thing of like after a thousand hours of doing it, you just know how to do it. Yeah, that yeah, might... I've got, that's probably the way. My 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 brain's not wired that way. I've had enough time like driving on the wrong side of the road in London. So <laughs> that sounds impossible. I can never do that. Oh right, God! Uh, so um, we asked our readers to send us Q and A questions for you, Brian. And there's even a couple here uh, for Ryan and myself. Um, All right. A lot of really great questions, but I also want to encourage everyone who's watching this live right now, feel free to um, ask more questions in the comments. Um, we're watching what you guys are saying. Uh, we'll ignore the stuff that we don't like. So feel free to say that stuff too. Um, and, uh, I guess we will just get started with this conversation between three white guys with beards and glasses. <laughs> yes. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I didn't Thank think you, Stacy. Wow. We, we have a type, don't we? Definitely. Uh, cool. All right. So, uh, let's, uh, let's ask a question for this, this cool guy who wrote some good books. Um, for, well, actually, first of all, before we get into that, I do want to ask you, like, how's your, how's your quarantine going? Brian? Uh, you know, we're good. It's funny because, you know, I, I, I know the two of you, I know your wives through social media and it's like, you're like me. It's like, I don't mind being stranded at home and quarantined stuck with my wife. Like we have a great time. And so yeah. it's, you know, it's actually, you know, we're having, we, we think it's fine. Um, people here in New Mexico are like doing pretty well with it. They're not... If you go to the stores, they're social distancing in line, but not when they're out shopping. So you know they're halfway there. But but uh, no, but uh, you know, like again, I know I know your wives, and uh, I know of your wives at least. And it's like we just we're having a great time at home together. And I'm sure you guys are too. There are worse people to be self isolated with. Yeah, absolutely. That's very true. Yeah, it's uh, it's hard though because uh, you know Ryan and I we live in New York City. We're at the the yeah episode. sort of ground zero there. Yeah, um, and so that makes things a little more terrifying. Um, like I would not go to the store yeah. if people were were uh, uh, dis distancing from each other at, in the shop. Um, we're also like we live in in small apartments, so we're not just you know sharing space with our wives. We're sharing like two rooms <laughs> with our wives. Right. So wouldn't it be nice if we yeah, had, like, that's true, or a yard? <laughs> or, like, I don't know. Uh, like you have a dog, right? So you like get out and walk around the neighborhood. Yeah, in fact, my wife, while I'm doing this, is out walking our dog right now. So yep. you'll not run into another single person. So yeah, some people yep. are going outside. Well, like, I mean, welcome, to, welcome to Rio Rancho, New Mexico. So. <laughs> hey, Ryan, you have a, you have a dog. Is that is that difficult for you to like get outside once a day? Or a uh, no, I, I've been we've been walking the dog and just trying to keep further distance from other people than usual. Like there's still, I mean, there's a surprising number of people who are just out and about as if they don't understand what's happening but yeah you just try to keep our distance from from all those potential germ carriers yeah cool yeah. well and there, I just, and there i just touched my face but i'm, I'm happy uh, to that one I help it i touch my face all the time <laughs> <laughs> you get a dog i hear those little clip clops of his yeah we he's gonna make a cameo here just very quickly can you pup can you perform him oh look at that guy hi munchy Hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the chat. <laughs> it's uncanny. Thanks. Uh, like it. So uh, let's let's uh, pick a question here uh, to ask you. Um, so I'll start with this one. Uh, Jeremy Wilcox wrote to us and asked, uh, was there something that you thought you knew about Jim Henson or the Muppets, but then through your research, you discovered that you were completely wrong? Um. 
Yes. I mean, first of all, I had, uh, because you I only read it in the newspapers, uh, the whole Christian science angle with Jim getting oh. sick and death, that he refused treatment and that narrative, uh, you know, that was the narrative that I knew of going into it. I knew no other narrative. So once I found out um, really what was happening with that, it was actually one of the important sort of urban myths that I wanted to bust on that and, and really go into sort of, you know, some people call it a little graphic, but go into some real detail on, you know, Jim's treatment and and uh, and a little bit on Christian science and what it meant to him and how sometimes it didn't mean stuff to him. And, and um, you know, that was that was one of the myths I really wanted to bust and spend some time on. Yeah, you're a regular Adam Savage. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a lot of these seem, things seem to just kind of get reduced. Like somebody hears that Jim came from a Christian science background and then they hear about the circumstances of his his passing and they just kind of put it together, whether it makes sense or not. Yeah, I mean, and that was how it was reported and, you know, sort of carried on down the line through the next two decades. So, And I, and I think people really wanted to, like, have something to blame. Uh, for yeah, you know, you're absolutely right, because it's I mean, it's it's very frustrating when you're reading that chapter. And, you know, and, you know, we know how it ends, but you're like, dude, you know, what are you doing? Yeah. Um, and, and I think I've told this story before, but when I was, you know, when I was researching this book, I was in London in 2009 and I actually got swine flu when I was over there. And oh, uh, cool. it felt god awful, and like I was gonna die. And you know what I did about it? Nothing, because that's kind of what guys who are relatively healthy do. Is you're just like, no, nah, just ride this. Yeah. You know, and now we're in the age of coronavirus, I'm telling the story, but yeah. um, you know, that's kind of what you do. You're like, I can ride this out. I'll be fine. And I think that's where Jim's mind was on this. Yeah. Um, the point in that story, we want to grab him by the lapels and shake him, is when he actually self-reported this later when he checked into the doctor. But when he'd been in North Carolina, he he had coughed blood a couple of times, and that's the time when you're that's the moment you're like, you know, you you, you really should have done a little bit more than that than go home and sit in the tub. Yeah, um, that, that's the moment that's very frustrating. Yeah, yeah, you don't go back to work after. after yeah, that. and you know, and again, he's you know, he's only fifty three, which I'm fifty two, and I'm gonna go home and soak in the tub and get over it. But um, yeah. you know, I really think that's what he thought, and that's and that's that's the really hard part. What do you blame? You blame you blame guys for being guys, basically on that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's fair. Uh, and yeah, same. Like I would, I would do the same thing. Like, cause also, you know, every time I'm like, well, I'll go to the doctor. My insurance says it's just a copay. And the next thing right. you know, no, actually there was all this fine print crap that <laughs> right, right. dollars and there's inconclusive. It's like, of course I don't want to go to the doctor because our healthcare system is broken. That's a whole nother, that's a whole nother interview. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's a, that's a different uh, website. Yeah. We don't, we don't need to get into that's that. a different problem. Um, all right, let's uh, let's keep going with some questions here. Uh, Ryan, feel free to chime um, in. Yeah, I, I wanted to uh, get to this one from Scott Joy, which is, of known abandoned Muppet projects, what do you most wish had been made? Are there any that stand out? I, I got a few myself. Cheapest Muppet movie ever made. God, Hands that's Hands one of mine, yeah. Uh, I would pay I mean, so much money to see to see that script. Oh God, it's it's great. Um, and I didn't. I wish I was telling somebody I didn't get to read the entire thing because it was one of those things I came up on on kind of the last day I was in the archives, and I was like, Oh my oh, God! Oh. Um, but you know, it's like the script is great. The, you know, the idea is just hilarious. I love it. You know, starting off high def and then going into like film and then slide. Or I mean, it's just it's it's fantastic. Just fantastic. It's a great story. It's a great script. It's no wonder Jim and Jerry Joel loved it. It's no wonder Frank Oz loves it. There's the one that I wish they would make. And it's there for the taking as far as I know. Well, and I think the the, the added tragedy on top of that was like, that would have been something to bring Frank Oz back into the Muppet fold. And because it was passed on, he was like, yeah. I, I think that was the moment for him to say like, you know what? I don't need this anymore. Yeah, right, that's I, the one he tried. Know, that's the one he pitched to Disney back before the the 2011 movie got made. Okay, that's what I was going to ask. Get... I, I don't know how far along that got. Interesting. Yeah, because yeah, uh, they there was um like a Disney press conference or something like that, and they showed the title screen, which was it was just the words "cheapest Muppet movie ever made" on a piece of paper that was crumpled up and then <laughs> laid out again. Um, and so that's what we were expecting up until uh, the Jason Segel movie was yeah. was announced. No, that's the one. That's that's the heartbreaker. That's the one I would have loved to have seen. And it's like I said, it's ready to go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My other one is Star Boppers. I don't know. Uh, Star Boppers. If, if anyone else cares about that one, but just that, there's that one like that's kind of presentation one. pitch clip of Jim uh, performing that character that just makes it seem like a, a show I would have liked to watch. 
Yeah, I, yeah, it's that that one to me when I was reading all the paperwork and I was like, this is so goofy. But yeah, it's another one. Again, who knows? I mean, it's these again really interesting ideas that he had constantly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so as one of our commenters is suggesting uh, that cheapest Muppet movie ever made should be made for Disney Plus, which would be a great idea. That would be fantastic. I feel like ironically, though, despite the title, it would probably need a pretty big budget. Well, I mean, that was like, the irony of it anyway, because they, they actually had big stars in it. Like Meryl Streep was going to play like some intern in it. And, and right. I mean, like they had huge funny ideas. There's an exploding volcano in it at one point, And well, it, was not, just, it was not going to be the cheapest Muppet movie ever made. Yeah, I do remember Frank Oz saying that that that's the reason that that it didn't happen back in the day because it's incredibly expensive to make something look cheap. Yeah, right. Yeah, very. Yeah, well put. Yeah. Uh, so uh, one of the commenters, uh, Wagoner stuff, is asking if there's a Muppet person that you would want to write a biography for uh, in the Muppet circles. Um, <laughs> I mean, the no-brainer that the one we'd all love to get is 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 Oz. Um, who will never sit still long enough, doesn't want to do it, pushes back hard on this. I've, I've you know, not talked with him seriously. I've joked with it about it, and I know that it's going no further than that. But fascinating, and his family history is, you know, really fascinating. His parents were essentially, you know, like Nazi hunters. Um, just a really fascinating, interesting guy. So, and, yeah, and another one. Go ahead. Somebody should make a movie out of that. Nazi hunting yeah. years. Yeah. That's a story in itself. A, yeah. you know, super interesting guy and an opinionated guy and a guy with, you know, strong opinions and stuff. You got to love that. It'd be, it'd be great. Yeah. And related to that, um, Jack Laughlin asked us uh, via email, uh, besides the Muppet show, which is obvious, uh, what other Muppet stuff would you like to see added to Disney plus? Uh, Muppets at Walt Disney world. Um, that's, that's my go-to for every, every time I, I talk about it. It's an, it's a, like everything is there. It's it like pretty obvious. There's already yeah. so many advertisements for um, the Disney parks on Disney Plus, and there's yeah, one that they. It's, it's, really great cool. a, it's great as a timepiece too. Like I love those sort of like step back in time, and the, I mean, I, I think it'd be, I think it'd be great. And as we were talking about earlier this week, when the Vanity Fair article came out, I'll get to speculate at this point. I don't know what's going on, but that, yeah, that's one that would be. It seems again like a no brainer. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and there's so many specials, there's so many appearances, and Disney owns so much of it. I don't know if part of the reason is because the quality isn't so good that things would have to be remastered, but I don't think people care. I don't think people need to see it in like. I don't think so I mean, they're showing the old 19, you know, reruns of, I think there's five or eight episodes of the old Mickey Mouse Club on there, and they're fantastic. Yeah. Just, I mean, and again, really interesting little, you know, snapshot of time. I just, I love them. I watched all of them in about two nights, they were just fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, There's, my hope is that as they, you know, try to add more stuff that's not there yet to try to make sure we keep subscribing to Disney Plus, that maybe they'll get around to some of that Muppet stuff later. That would be that's, great. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's optimistic. It's. I think it's optimistic to think that Disney has a long term plan. For the <laughs> yeah. It's even cynical, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Someone uh, asked in the chat. Hang on, let me go back to it. Um, oh, Stacy Rosen. We know her. That's oh, yeah. Brian, Brian's wife and Stacy Rosen. Okay. Uh, I, was her, I was chatting with her on Twitter earlier today. Ah, uh, she wants to know what Muppet media have you did you consume before you started to write the Jim Henson biography? Uh, I mean, like, most of most of it because I'm the right I'm the right age group for it. I mean, I'm you know I'm as I always say I'm. You know, I was with Sesame Street. I was there for day one of the Muppet Show. I even watched the Muppets on Saturday Night Live wow. at an inappropriate age. Um, <laughs> so I had kind of consumed all of it. Um, I saw all three of the Henson, you know, the, the movies that we made when Jim was alive. I saw Dark Crystal in the theater. I saw Labyrinth in the theater. As as Lisa Henson said, "Oh, you were the one." Right. Um, <laughs> That's not many people can say that. Yeah, I did. I did not watch Jim Henson Hour when that was on, and so the ones, so the ones from his lifetime, at least, that I had to sort of catch up on was Storyteller, mm -hmm. um, when I hadn't, I hadn't seen much of. And then, you know, of course, the ones that were sort of before my time, like Jimmy Dean, uh, mm -hmm. I went back and watched the commercials. So, you know, the commercials were all new to me. Uh, they're just so great. The, the Wilkins Me commercials was just some of my absolute favorite stuff he did. Yeah, um, but everything that sort of existed in my timeline. I had, I had watched, you know, when it aired at that time. So was there something that, um, I'm trying to think how to phrase this, that, uh, well, well, let's say that, like, was there something that you visited for the first time after doing your research or once you started doing your research for the book that became like one of your favorite 
Muppet things, like um, something that's like, like, how did I miss this? Like something you didn't know about before you started researching? Yeah, no, great, great question. And and I mean, my immediate answer on that is Rolf on Jimmy Dean. Mm. Um, had you, and it was funny. So when I was a kid, you know, when the Muppet Show was on, my mother would say, "Oh, my mom and I used to watch Rolf the dog on the Jimmy Dean." Show. I was like, "No, you didn't, Mom. There were no Muppets back in the old days." And of course, she was right. <laughs> And, uh, and actually said that my grandmother, uh, you know, was fascinated by Rolf and didn't know how he worked. Um, mm. So so going back and seeing, you know, seeing those those Rolf appearances with Jimmy Dean and, and uh, it, it's, that's just some of my absolute favorite stuff that I had never seen before until I started on this project. Uh, absolutely love him. When I talk about Jim and Joe, you've seen my you've seen me talk about Jim once. I always show the clip of uh, he and Jimmy Dean with the, the straw hats because it's a great example of how, you know, how live handing works and it's just and it's just a fantastic clip because the audience clearly knows what has happened behind the wall and he right. has, it's just, i mean the, the bit just kills that's um, great so, so that's the one where where they have they're doing like a dance thing with their hats and, and, and the hat falls off his head and then so jimmy dean puts his hat on rolf and then you know oz hands up the other hat from behind the, the other wall. hat magically it's, materializes from behind the wall yeah it's, it's just because yeah. so, people kind of know what's happening behind the wall it's just it's such a great moment. So yeah, the, the Rolf on the Jimmy Dean was the one. I just fell in love with it. And because of that to this day, when I started the project, Ernie was my favorite Muppet. Now, hands down, it is Rolf. Mm. Good choice. And did your grandmother ever figure out how it <laughs> works? It's funny, I actually asked my mom about this even just like a couple of weeks ago and no, she never did. Uh -huh. uh, no, but I agree with you on the Rolf thing. When I, when I was younger, um, the only Jimmy Dean show stuff that i had seen was that one little clip that was in i think it was in the muppets celebrate 30 years where um uh rolf's uh belly is being inflated oh yeah he says my belly button blew up and i i knew that there was a lot that i had never seen and i had no way to watch it and now uh now that i do have access to that stuff because it's it was um the jimmy dean show was airing recently on some network um, um RFD is that what it's called? Yeah, that sounds right. And, and so some people in the Muppet fan community have been, have been kind of grabbing those those video files for us to watch them. And when I see any one of them, you can pick any one of them at random. There's dozens of them, oh, and they're all hysterical. And the songs are good, and it's so cool to see Jim Henson like figure out how to be how to be funny. Not that he wasn't funny before, right. but he really was like like learning a craft with no teacher. He was just going for it. And, and I, I mean, absolutely charming. And the other thing I always tell people is like, click a stopwatch and time how long he's sitting back there with an arm over his head. Oh, yeah. Because, <laughs> um, and, and I, you know, I, I told Dave Goals this. Sinatra told me never to name drop, and I'm going to name drop Dave Goals. Um, <laughs> I, I was telling him, I was like, when I hang a light and I have to stand with my arms over my head for two minutes, I am wrecked. And, you know, he's back there doing this seven minutes, five minutes, seven minutes constantly, you know, nonstop doing it live. It's flying without a net. It's just it's just amazing. It's just they're charming. They're funny. They're just great bits. And I and hope then, more them keep showing up. Yeah. And then do that every day for 30 years. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. Oh, my God. I, can't do that. I do like to ask puppeteers, what's the longest you've ever held your arm up? And every single one when you ask them that's that, that question, they have a story about, oh, my sure. God, this one time. And I had to do a puppet show for 30 minutes. And I just had to be there with my arm up for 30 minutes. Yeah, I can't even imagine. I asked uh, Matt Vogel um, the longest he held his arm up. He says, well, you know, we do the, the Macy's parade. And oh, that's wow. like several hours where you're going down the parade. And when you're like, you know, the Sesame characters, when they're like up in the um, the one, two, three um, uh, house, you know, they've got things they can kind of rest on. But when you're Big Bird and you're up front in that big nest and there's nowhere, like there's nowhere to hide. There's nowhere yeah. that you were gonna put it down for a second or rest it on a on a windowsill or something yeah. and so what he told me was um uh they had a uh they they keep one of the muppet wranglers next to big bird and who's mm -hmm. there waiting pretending to be you know just another person on the, on the, on the on. yeah I, I can imagine doing big bird and having to you know be stuck you know buried alive inside that costume at the same time you're doing it as well so uh so he said that um every every few minutes the puppet wrangler would turn to big bird and say big bird do you need a hug? And Big Bird will go, yes, I need a hug. And then he would just kind of like rest his arm <laughs> his shoulder and just pretend to hug for a second. And then, okay, back up. Very Do that over and over again for, what is that, like three hours around that route? Right. I don't know. Uh, Insane. Uh, cool. Ryan, do you have another question you want to um, I saw a, a question in the comments uh, come by from Patrick Cotnoir. Uh, who do you wish you had gotten to talk to for research that you didn't get a chance to talk to? Uh, well, I couldn't talk to him because they were dead. Unfortunately, the one I would have loved to have spoken with is Richard Hunt. 
mm. um, you know, who passed mm. away in 94, I think it was, two or four. Uh, Richard, I would have loved to have spoken with Richard. I would have loved to have been able to speak with Bernie Brillstein. Uh, those are just these two bigger than life personalities. And it, it, I just loved asking all the Muppet performers about Richard Hunt. And I, I use the quote in the book because Oz summed him up perfectly, called him a force of nature. I just, <laughs> it's a quote I love. And he said something like, you know, he's like his, for, his craft wasn't always that great, but it just didn't matter. <laughs> he was just so funny. He was just a comedic force. So I would have loved to have talked with Richard Hunt. Yeah. Yeah, we, we've met a few of his family members uh, over the over the years. And there are, I mean, none of them are, are Richard, but they're all fascinating people. And they've got great stories. That, yeah. yeah, it's another one, too, where everyone who worked with them definitely has a lot of stories. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. And, uh, you know, Brian Henson told me a funny story about how he was, uh, you know, he would, they'd be out on the boat with Jim and Richard was there. And Richard would, like, sneak out. They would, they would dock and Rich would sneak up to the top of the hill to go, you know, smoke a joint. And Brian was like, I want to go up there with Richard. And Jim was like, no, no, we can't go up there with Richard. I'm going to wait for Richard to come back down the hill. <laughs> wow. Uh, oh, hey, the Muppet Wiki is watching. That's probably Scott. Hello, Scott. Uh, hey, he's asked, Hi, Muppet uh, Wiki. What is the weirdest thing you found during your Henson research that did not make it into the book? If you can even tell us, you know, I, I can't, I can't actually think of anything right now that, that, that was like weird. And I'm like, Oh my God, I have to get this in there. And then we couldn't get it in. Um, you know, the, the stuff that I, if I thought it was weird, that tended to go in first. Uh, for well, the you got the LSD story in there. The LSD story in there and the, um, I'm sorry, everybody, I'm going to use the, you know, the, the Jim Henson, what the F are you talking about? Response letter <laughs> to the guy on, on the cube. Um, you know, I, that, as soon as I read that, I'm like, well, that's going in for sure. So, uh, so the weird stuff I actually tended to push to the front of the line and stuff that got cut, for example, like, I, I, again, I love the Wilson's Meats commercials. I don't even think there's a mention of them in there just because they're, you know, just mm -hmm. time or space. Um, so, so I think all the weird stuff that I really liked went in first. And, you know, that was, that was a priority to bump the other stuff off. The, you know, one of the things I always talk about is the story of them meeting the queen. Uh, for the Jubilee, I started a chapter with that, and that was when my editor came back to me and said, "This chapter starts about two pages later, uh, mm -hmm. so the whole front end has to go off." So we lost all the Jubilee stuff, so which is not all that weird. So that's that's what tended to go more than anything else is the stuff that was sort of backing it up. The weird stuff never backed anything up because it's so weird and fascinating. Right. I mean, I have to assume. I mean, because first of all, I mean, you're you're as a biographer, you're summing up someone's entire life into, into one book, which is already difficult enough to, to know what to keep, what to, what to lose, right. et cetera. But Jim always seemed to be doing 19 things at once. So he was living several lifetimes throughout, you know, his time on, on this planet. Um, so I imagine there had to be a lot of stuff that you just couldn't, you just had to skip. Well, yeah. you know, again, yes, because especially the stuff coming out of the 60s, which is just utterly fat, one of my favorite periods in his life, because that's where the weird stuff is really going on, that very experimental phase. But reading through his scripts and, you know, stuff you couldn't put in just because it wasn't in the room, the book would have been 700 pages long, and I think it's already 500. Mm -hmm. uh, there, you know, great. He, he would he would handwrite lyrics to fully realized songs for the Broadway show that he was determined to do. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm, that's all in there. I'm, by the how, way. how long is it? 603? What'd you say? Uh, 585. 87, that's right. Yeah. George Lucas, I think, is 603. Uh, um, I can't ever do him first. <laughs> um, it's so, you know, things like that where there was a lot of stuff I would have loved to have gone into even more detail on because it was so interesting. Again, the songs from the Broadway show, he writing out the lyrics by hand on yellow pad. Um, oh, you know, stuff like that. It's things he was just determined to do and had I, I wish we could have reproduced a lot of the art from the from the Broadway show he was pitching, things like that. So so the biggest problem you ran into was as you were saying, Joe, he had so many balls in the air at a time that you just you couldn't dedicate the space to every project that you wanted to give to it. The book would have been, you know, instead of five eighty seven, would have been a thousand eighty seven problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would well, have we have we have seen things like Turkey Hollow and Tale of Sand mm -hmm. uh, make their way to us in, in other forms. So maybe maybe we'll see like an animated version of that Broadway show or something. You never know. Yeah. And, and I mean what's so fascinating about the Broadway show is again once again it's Jim being right about something but at the wrong time. You know, he's out there explaining this to people and the people are like, no one wants to see the puppeteers on stage. So no one's gonna buy that. That. And so, you know, it, he's ahead of the curve again. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, was, was there anything that you, in your research, I was, would assume with with um, the with Disney or the Henson Company, um, that you got to see that was like super rare 
no, maybe you couldn't even like maybe it wasn't even space for it in the uh, in the book, but just you know something that's not on YouTube. It was never been released, you know, commercially or whatever. That uh, you know, you just kind of got your eye eyeballs on that maybe none of us have seen. Yeah, I mean that that answer has changed now because so much of that stuff you know creeps out on the YouTube now that you know I mean it used to be there was you, there was no Sam and Friends anywhere you could find one episode, sure and now, yeah. and now there's quite a bit of it out there and I don't I don't know where it's coming from but uh, you know some of that stuff so you can see stuff before so that was that that was like you know finding you know finding the Lost Ark of the Covenant on some of that stuff was yeah. getting getting to see those old Sam and Friends clips and a lot of those old commercials and things like that a lot of which is, has come out now I mean th th again. The Wilkins commercials, I just absolutely love, and those are out all over the place now as well, too. Um, yeah. So the answer has changed somewhat over the last, I mean, when that will come out, was it seven years now? Because so much of it is, has started to creep out there and show up. How about like um, like scripts or artwork or something like that? Maybe that that like you didn't even know you didn't even know existed in them. Well, I, I do love, um, and I don't know if it's been reprinted anywhere. The entire pitch, the you know, original written pitch for the Muppet Show from his archives from you know sixty five, sixty six, when he's got Kermit being I can't remember the name Elmore Fidge or something, and they're reviewing movies that have you know dirty sounding names to them. It, it, you know, it's Jim's very late sixties sensibility on display and that kind of stuff. And that was the kind of fun stuff to find is is these things that look very different than what they ultimately turned out to be. You know, the Muppet Show pitch being one of them. Uh, I loved the pitch and the pitch reel for the Jim Henson Hour, which you now can find online. I, I love that thing. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and, and that's what I, I tweeted that at some of the other day, and I said, you know, this this is another one we just want to you just wring your hands at what might have been because it's such a beautiful pitch, and it, it's so upsetting that you know NBC had no faith in letting him do it the way he wanted to. It's just so beautifully done. Right. You just think about if like if Jim Henson had gotten unlimited money and network uh, airtime to do whatever he wanted. Yeah. To and letting him do something different every week instead of being like, yeah. oh, all those ideas, put them all in one hour. It, I mean, at that point, it's just a disaster. But that original pitch reel is just gorgeous. And, and and that's out there now, too. So that was another one when I first got, you know, got to see that they handed me the DVD with the pitch on it. You're just like, oh, my God, this is this is just, you know, this is the the holy grail here. Just getting to see this kind of stuff. So yeah, it's, I still it's kind of great it is out there now, but uh, I, I still want to know if he actually had a specific uh, project in mind for a, a musical about a magical bowling ball, which is one <laughs> of the ideas he mentions in that pitch. Yeah, I want to see that. Yeah, um, I don't think I don't remember seeing. I don't know that it ever got any further than just the description of the idea. So maybe not. There's no script out there. I don't for... remember seeing a script on that, but the, the description. I mean, that is like he says it out loud, and I think it's even written down at one point. But uh, that's a great question. I don't. I don't actually remember if I saw anything. Yeah. On that. But I, I. I think I even mentioned that in the book because it was such a weird idea. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Marshall Grover, who is our friend Shane, is asking a question. I'm gonna. I'm gonna paraphrase, uh, change a little bit. He's. He's asking if there was an unfinished project that you saw that may not have been that successful, but I guess I'm more curious about, is there anything that you saw that you thought maybe an unfinished project? I mean, that maybe you would think like that wouldn't work. That wouldn't I mean, work. it's yeah. Like that, like, I don't know what Jim was necessarily thinking, or I can't like wrap my brain around it probably. Cause I, I mean, let's be honest, like anything Jim did probably would have been, if not successful, super interesting. I, that was, I was like just going to use that word, interesting, even if it wasn't. Yeah, the one, the one I would, the one I love, and he just, I think what happened with with it more than anything is he just, he just ran out of clock on it. Um, the one I think is a really cool idea that might not have worked, but again, I would have loved to have seen it is Cyclia. I would. Uh, have, exactly I would what I was thinking. Love yeah. to see how he would have realized that. I mean, that's something that I, you know, I, I, you almost are like, maybe he would have done that out on like Pleasure Island at Disney. You know, like they would have let him set it up out there and let him do it the way he wanted to. Like with the big inflatable dome, I love that idea. But I would, I would have loved to have seen how he actually would have pulled that off because he never really landed on exactly what the idea was. He was always like, it could be any of these seven things. Mm -hmm. um, it would have been so interesting to see what he actually did with that. Can, can you explain to people, for people who don't know what Cyclia is? Oh, sure. So Cyclia was Jim's, <laughs> was Jim's vision of sort of an adult, not like, x-rated but just it was a club for grown-ups before any of these kinds of things existed it was sort of a themed nightclub and jim envisioned this it was you know this is like 67 68 so there's a lot of psychedelic sort of ideas going on um he wanted to have and a lot of the ideas he had the technology wasn't there yet but is now so he'd envisioned dance floors that you know were translucent that you could project music videos on that would play in time with the music 
And he wanted the walls to be sort of that you would project the videos on and they would scatter around the room. And then uh, one of the ideas is so crazy is every hour on the hour, he would lower a woman out of the ceiling and sort of a white, you know, leotard and then project the movies on her while she danced, which he actually sort of realizes later in Youth 68 with like the chroma key, sort of the same idea. But it was, oh, it was, yeah. it was this very sort of interesting, sort of hippie, sort of psychedelic idea. But even interesting ideas for where the building would be. You know, at one point he had actually was looking for property in New York and had envisioned taking a vacant lot in New York City and putting an inflatable dome in it, and then putting you know this dance floor inside. Just all all sorts of just fantastic ideas that never you know actually went fairly far on the page. Again, he's out actually looking at land and is you know trying to price out lands and make offers. And Doesn't they shot footage. Finished. They shot a lot of film footage for it. it, it too. In fact, Frank Oz says that that's the first, that's the place where he learned how to cut film hot. As he mm -hmm. said, he was on the back of a motorcycle with the camera running. And he actually filmed the crowd footage, he said, at Shea Stadium when the Beatles were there. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. So that's that crowd footage is actually at Shea Stadium while the Beatles. So Oz is there and he's like, and I've got my back to the fucking stage. And he's filming, oh. so he's filming the crowd while the Beatles are playing behind him. So, uh, so Oz says, you know, that that was formative for him because that was where he learned how to edit and splice film at that. For that wow. so, yeah. And cool. uh, our friend uh, David Hirsch reminds us in the comments that there's a room at the Henson exhibit in the Museum of the Moving Image here yep. in New York where you can actually see kind of an idea of, of what cycle it would look like projected on a wall. Yeah, they have a fragmented wall up and they project the movies on it. So, they, yeah, they've got that part of the ideas up in the wall. It's very, yeah. very cool. Yeah, it's cool. Um, JD Hansel, hi JD. Hey, JD. Uh, we, uh, he's asking us in the comments, uh, what biographies by other authors have inspired your writing style, and mm -hmm. whose work do you recommend to people who like your books? So, one of the books that I absolutely love that I wanted the Jim Henson bio to sort of be like is um, Neil Gabler's Walt Disney biography. Uh, it's just I, I've got it on my shelf. I won't get up and pull it down, but it's it's just a fantastic book, very deeply researched, beautifully written, divided up into sections. I love dividing stuff into parts into sections, and um, it's, that that is the the book that I wanted Jim Henson to be. I just I love that book. I admire that book. He's a fantastic writer. Doesn't write nearly enough, um, but if you like Jim Henson and you like the book Jim Henson. Read Neil Gabler because, first of all, it's Disney, so you get to read about Walt Disney, which is kind of all in our wheelhouses, I think, as well. Um, have you, you? I guarantee you've read that book, haven't you, Joe? I, I haven't. No. You haven't? Oh, and, and it's another one that's like that thick, so also right in my sort of in my wheelhouse. It's a huge book, uh, so that's that's a book I absolutely love. Um, I'm a big fan of Robert Caro's books, and that's an easy answer for biographers to give because he's sort of our Elvis in a way. Um, <laughs> but but he's another one of these guys that like really digs into the research. He, as, as he even says himself, he's, he's writing the fifth volume of his four volume series on Lyndon Johnson right now. Um, the sixth one hasn't come out yet. So, and he's 87, I believe, so we better hurry up. Um, I'm sorry, I fell asleep. <laughs> Fantastic biographer who's just got a really great style, very, you know, a very conversational journalistic style. And that's that's the thing, I, I tend to lean toward these, these um, biographers who are not necessarily academic they're a little they're either journalists or they're what you know people can they actually in the biography field i'm considered an amateur because i'm not an academic um those tend to be the ones i lean toward because it's i i i, I like to look for things and stories that i find interesting and tell those stories and that's what i think some of these great biographies do is you look at the time period you look at the work through the life and the life through the work and i think that's what some of these great biographies do so the, the neil gabler's one i would definitely uh, recommend for people to read robert caro if you want uh, the, the books are long but they're fantastic um the, those are those are probably the, the two big ones another biography that i absolutely love and i'm a huge beatles nerd and i love this book because it's so awful but is albert goldman's lives of john lennon it is just uh, just a spectacular train wreck of a book and i absolutely <laughs> love it Great, there you have right. it. Keep <laughs> like a like a wish list of of people that like you know, if given all the permission and all the money and all the time in the world that you would want to write biographies of. Can I answer that because I'm trying to figure out what I want my next project to be, because um, it's really hard. Um, it's hard because a lot of times when you think of somebody that'd be great, you're like, well, somebody else has already done that, or he was done. You know, uh -huh. there's sort of a there's sort of a statute of limitations on when you can go back and look at a live, for example. Um, so or you find out somebody's doing it or, um, or he's been done recently. You know, everybody always tells me, oh, with the books you've done, you should do Mr. Rogers. Well, you know, he was just done. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. You should do Steven Spielberg. Well, you know, he was done by, on an academic press, a fan, a huge, thick book, um, an awesome book and who, and he didn't have Spielberg. 
Um, so I don't know, can you get Spielberg? If I could get Spielberg, would I do it? Probably, that, that, that's one I would probably do. But yeah. that's the hardest part of it is trying to figure out like what's sort of in your lane? Um, what are you interested in enough to live with it for three to five years? So that's the hardest part of biographies. You sort of do have to line up your subject with your biographer a little bit. Was it different writing uh, a, a, about a living subject when you wrote the George Lucas book as opposed to your other subjects? I didn't, not, not necessarily, I didn't find it that hard. Um, the only issue is you, you have to end it differently. I mean, every, you know, right. the, the great thing about writing about dead people is like your entire storyline is plotted out. With this one, as I'm approaching, you know, the end of the book, like I'm keeping my eye on the newspapers. Like, what is he doing? Where is he going? What do I want to build toward? And actually the last line of that book came out from an interview he did like two or three months before I wrote the last word of it. Mm. Um, it's a great quote where they're asking him what he wants on his tombstone. And he says, I tried, which I think is just hilarious. <laughs> Um, so, and that's actually the last quote of the book, but that came around like right as I was approaching the end of the book, uh, he said that in an interview. So I was like, oh, that's great. That's that's the quote I want. Um, so that, you know, makes it a little harder because the goalpost is moving while you're writing the book. Um, whereas with, you know, Jim and Dr. Seuss and <laughs> Washington Irving, um, you already you already sort of know how the story at least ended. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then the hard part is, you know, with Jim, like somebody wanted to talk to me about the Disney, the only thing or, you know, Know, what happened after it. And, and I'm not so great on that because that was sort of beyond the scope of where I had done a lot of my, I mean, I've read about it. Um, but I think I was even talking with you about it one time, Joe, like you, you know more about probably what happened in 2004 than I do. Um, because that was just like, I stopped in, you know, 1990. And, right. And, and you're I don't usually. Biography. Yeah. The history of the company you're writing is about one person. It's about him. So, yeah. So, I, you know, I, I mentioned it in sort of in the preface saying what sort of happened with it. But when people start asking me about details, I'm like, you know, I, I, I got, yeah, I punched my ticket now. I don't, I don't know that much about that. <laughs> Tell me everything story. about Muppets tonight. Yeah. And that, yeah, that is hard for me. Cause I'm like, I, I don't know that much about that. Yeah. And that that's what, again, where I just get absolutely creamed in like Muppet trivia and things like anything post 1990. I'm just like, I'm just done. Yeah. Uh, you, you were talking about George Lucas a minute. I, I do have to ask you, are you familiar with the George Lucas talk show? Do you know about this? Yeah. In fact, in fact, um, Connor or no, or um, uh, somebody, one of the questions came from somebody who's affiliated with them. Yeah, it's Patrick. Patrick, 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 Patrick. Yeah. yeah, Patrick. No, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I have. I've actually I've talked with Connor several times, both on and offline, and uh, I've wanted to do that show with him. So he invited me on like right when the book came out, and we just have never been able to make it happen. Like he's he does the first, I think the first Friday of, of the month. I think. Uh, I don't remember, it's about yeah. once a month, yeah. Like, and I was going to be in New York on the on Friday uh, one night. It was going to work perfect, but it wasn't the first Friday of the month, so we didn't line it up. But I would I would love to do his show. And Connor's so funny anyway. I would oh, do yes. <laughs> And for, we for should people, probably understand. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. For people who don't know, the, the, the George Lucas Talk Show is a, is a show that happens at the UCB Theater in New York City. Uh, it's a couple of improv comedians. Uh, one of them is uh, basically dressed in, in personifying George Lucas of today. And he... I mean, honestly, like he's I, hosting I can't a talk show. Yeah, I can't really describe like like because uh, he's talking about like Star Wars as if it's this thing that he did, and then he lost control of it to Disney, and he's bitter about it. And he also made this movie called Red Tails, and this thing called. <laughs> How I mean, like it go, he knows everything about the yeah. history of George Lucas, and, and he doesn't side, break character. No, he doesn't break character because like the people who are on yeah. the show, by the way, are real celebrities. Uh, like last time Ryan and yeah. I went to. See Isaac Mizrahi was was one of the guests, and um, uh, they're like asking him things like you know that they would ask to Connor to you know like isn't this like why are you dressed like this and he's responding <laughs> he's George Lucas he does not break, and his sidekick is uh, uh, Watto from <laughs> Star Wars oh, episode God. right, and he's got the big you know fake nose well the nose, uh, yep, uh, played by Griffin Newman who who was on the Tick. Um, the more oh, more recent, uh, it's just it's hysterical. And if you're in New York City, you should go see the show. Yeah, no, I, I, we we were trying to actually where I could go on it and talk to George Lucas as his biographer, and it was a really funny idea. And we just could never make the schedules work. I'm sure you'll you'll figure it out. Yeah, I would. Yeah, I, 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 Connor's so funny. Anyway, like I always tell everybody, he's in Marvelous Mrs. Maisel one season. He's just great in it. So. Yeah, I don't think I knew that. He's the guy uh, that says crisscross. Yeah, he's the guy at the camp who's always sort of lurking around. <laughs> I haven't seen Miss Maisel yet. I'm not, I know. Yeah, that's great. Right. Uh, Tell us right, in the so comments if you think Joe should watch Mrs. Maisel. <laughs> Is my dad watching? Because he's going to be like, yeah. I, know, I saw you talking to Dylan about Glow, and I think his, Dylan's response on that kind of floored you a little bit, Joe. 
I know. Well, I was, I was yeah. So the other day, I interviewed uh, Dylan Postel from uh, who played, it was uh, Hornswoggle on WWE, and I asked him if he'd seen Glow yet, and he said no. Which I I, I love. You were like toy boat, toy boat, toy boat. <laughs> you were just done. Uh, but uh, hopefully, I've convinced him <laughs> to watch it based on, solely based on the the fact that there is one Muppet reference yeah. somewhere series that he's gonna have to watch his response was great like very well thought out but it, it, it wasn't the response i expected when you asked that oh, same yeah uh so uh the muppet wiki is commenting uh giving you props for your collection of golden age batman books that are behind you oh the ones uh, right here. yeah you, you and i have talked online several times about our love of comic books uh do you uh who are your, some of your favorite characters or or titles or stories well i mean you don't have to look very far to see that like i'm i'm batman first and foremost and always have been even before it was cool <laughs> all the way back to super was it? All, the like way back, all the way back to super friends batman when if you took his utility belt away he was done um <laughs> so, so, I'm a, so i'm just a huge batman fan i was actually working in a comic shop uh, i was in college getting ready to graduate from college but i was managing a comic shop in here in new mexico the year the batman movie came out and you mm. know I, I was like the resident batman authority there so i'd be like well you know what we need to put up on the wall something 52 there's an appearance by batman in there yeah, so, <laughs> um, but I love, you know, I love those old Brave and the Bolds that Bob Haney writes. That it, like they take place in their own universe with their own logic, and they're not consistent with any other Batman title there is. But it's got gorgeous art by Jim Aparo, who's like my favorite Bat artist. Um, mm -hmm. I love anything Alan Moore writes. I'm making my way through his Provenance series right now, which is just fantastic and deep and rich and like hard to understand part of the time, which again is what makes him Alan Moore. <laughs> so I, re I read his stuff. And I'm like, I'm not sure I'm smart enough to read this. Um, but I'll read anything by him. And so, um, yeah, it's just one of those, one of those things that I've been doing since, you know, 1972. <laughs> great. Great. Well, Ryan and I are both uh, huge fans. So we, we get it. Oh, yeah. Lifelong fans. Yeah. It, actually, if you could see inside the cabinet behind me right there, it's full of comic books. Oh, very good. Yeah. I've got, I've got a bunch of them in the closet. Like I, I, I uh, when I moved out here, it's like I, I had 18 boxes of comics and I sold off maybe, you know, seven boxes worth, but I held on to my, you know, Batman runs from like Batman 200 up and I've got detected from like 400 up. Like I held on to, I sold everything before that. I had the first Batgirl. I sold that, got rid of that. Wow. But, yeah. That's painful to have to get yeah. rid of that stuff. I had the first Harley Quinn, which I didn't even realize I had and you know, all that, but I got rid of a lot of that stuff. Wow. You just, just, um, like, I couldn't carry it around anymore. Oh, is there? there oh, go. Go. Yeah, very good. That shelf is literally, it's all the way up to the ceiling and it's two rows deep. <laughs> a lot of books. And then I got, I got, several long boxes in my parents house in cleveland that i have no idea how i'm ever going to get oh, yeah. well you can see on this shelf back here that that batman in the frame up there is actually something my daughter made me when i turned 50 because it's it's actually the cover of batman 50 behind a cutout of a silhouette of batman and oh, that's wow. like, batman 50 is like a great two-face appearance and the like lines up perfectly but so that's you know something she gave me because she knows yeah, that's that's awesome. right, right well, in my well, house so along well, with that, that's the uh that's the Batman, the animated series Batmobile with Batman over there. Uh, everybody else is fighting it out in the closet. But. Maybe uh, should, your next bio should be uh, Kane and Finger. Oh, that'd be interesting. That would be interesting, actually. Uh, should we do another Muppet-related question? Absolutely. What? We had we got a question from uh, Joshua Schmitz who asked, "Do you know of anyone who tried to who who the producers tried to get on the Muppet Show and couldn't?" Um. The story that I love, because they actually did make a relatively serious run, is they did try for the Beatles. Mm -hmm. um, and um, All, got, the four of them separately, presumably. Four of them separately got sort of passing interest from McCartney, got passing interest from Lennon. Um, so, you know, it was one of those that, like, you know, at least you know the mail got read. So that yeah. would have been that would have been cool. But because what I always loved is they did go to the, they would go to the staff and they say, you know, who excites you? And uh, I love the idea of them trying to you know, the writers wanted to get the entire Monty Python troop, which would have mm. been, I mean, you got John Cleese, which is nothing to sneeze at. Um, but, you know, that would have been fantastic. So it was really neat to see their list of sort of their wish list of who they would like to get um, versus who they got. But uh, the, the ones in there that really jumped out at me, of course, that, that I would have loved is, is Python and the Beatles on that. And I, I do love the fact that he would break, like Jim himself would write down like a list with men on one side and women on the other and wrote mm. be at the bottom of the women's column on that one. Um, <laughs> I seem to recall hearing somewhere that they they asked Paul McCartney and he wanted all of Wings to be on with him and they couldn't afford that, so he he wasn't on. I don't know where I heard that. I I haven't heard. I didn't see anything in the archives on that. That could well be. Story, but I, oh, okay. I didn't see the story that I heard, which I believe, if I remember correctly, Jerry Nelson told me uh -huh. was 
they um they tried to get the Beatles, they couldn't get John and Paul, but George and Ringo said yes, and they passed because they're like, mm-hmm. Well, if we, we want all four Beatles together. And <laughs> going, no, if you can get two Beatles, get two Beatles. For the Beatles reunion to happen on the Muppet show. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine? Like, yeah. I think when you get George Harrison on Saturday Night Live, like when they were offering the you know the three thousand dollars and they yeah. showed up the next week to try to take it and told them we thought they were being chintzy, which was great. Uh, th- this is going to sound like a non sequitur. Are you are you familiar with um, uh, everyday chemistry? Mm-mm. Okay, so this is going to be weird. Okay, so the, the story goes that oh, you know, actually, I'm not even going to try to attempt the story. <laughs> it but it involves parallel dimensions mm. and like a portal and something like that. And basically, someone found a tape in this al- alternate dimension of the Beatles, uh, th- like the Beatles. That had never actually broken up and they made an album and uh in reality what it is is someone took all four of the beatles solo work and they made this really amazing mashup and it's uh, called industry and it's online somewhere but it's, it's actually quite good um but with along with this the person had written the extended biography of what the beatles did oh after. yeah yeah and so um what's that called everyday chemistry i write that down do it uh and uh part of it was uh, one, one detail i remember was that the beatles broke up and then they reunited on the muppet show and that's when they were like okay maybe we can work together now that we're a little bit older and a little bit wiser we can we can stick together and so and like john lennon doesn't get shot but he does die a few years later and it, it's like they put way too much thought into this thing that really should have just been like we mashed up some songs <laughs> well you saw, you saw a while back on twitter when sean lennon was saying that he and Dad, he and John used to watch the Muppet Show together. It was the one thing that he yeah. remembered them doing together. Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah. like John would get up and turn the TV off during the commercials, and uh, and I like tried to step into it. And I was like, well, what I'm sure he means is like he would turn it down. And then Sean Lennon actually chimes into my feet. And he's like, nope, he got up and he turned it off, and we would yeah. miss parts of it. And I was like, oh, that's so terrible. And then my God, Sean Lennon replied to my tweet. Wow, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> You would think uh, that John Lennon could have afforded one of the earliest TVs with a remote control. You would think so, because apparently he always had it on anyway. But yeah, you would think he would just like do when you remember you would like click it, it would make that audible. Cling! Yeah. Oh, no, no. <laughs> uh, okay, Stacy is asking us: uh, Have you seen Dog City? And do you have a favorite dog? <laughs> <laughs> I have seen Dog City, and of course, my favorite dog in Dog City is Rolf. Oh yeah, of course. You get to see his feet. In yeah. Dog City. And, yeah, and that's a, it was, that's and that's another one, you know, again, that's a, another great unappreciated piece that wins Jim and Emmy. Yeah, yeah, Dog City really is. That's the kind of thing where, like, on paper, that should not have worked. It's right. just a bunch of dog puns, which is stupid, and you don't want to see that for a whole half hour. And yeah, yet, it's, it's, the, it's the painting of dogs playing cards, you know. I mean, that's right, like, yeah. right. It's well, dog puns, and it's a film noir parody, and yeah. it's a gangster movie, and it's yeah, it's it's there's one recognizable character, and right. And also, like again, like there's so many dog puns. There's so many dog puns. Yeah. It's like they threw them at you so fast and in such great quantities that you can't help but love it. Yeah. Well, and like you said, it doesn't seem on, on paper like it should work, and it completely does. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff like that. Like what we were saying before, you know, there might be there's some things out there that Jim Henson planned there where it's like I don't necessarily see that as something that would have worked, and yet, and yet here we are. Still talking about Dog City. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Twenty years later, I, it's been too long since I've seen it. I should rewatch it. You should. You should. Uh, what what kind of stuff, uh, Brian? Do you revisit nowadays? Now that you're like a few years out from from having worked on the book, like you still find yourself like rewatching or rereading <laughs> or rereading for the Muppets. Oh gosh, yes. Um, you know, it, it, I get caught up. I get caught up. Just uh, I'll put one on. Like the other day, I, I was tweeting stuff out about uh, Steve Martin's appearance. And I ended up watching like the entire Steve Martin episode on YouTube because they're not available on Disney Plus. Um, that's a great thing is you can go on, you can go on YouTube and find a lot of it. And I just I, get sucked. I, I didn't hear that. I didn't hear yeah. that. I get sucked down the hole of that. Watch. I watched the Steve Martin one. I watched the Christopher Reeve one again the other day. Mm. Uh, oh, you just you get sucked down. The hole. And I never get tired of watching Sesame clips. Uh, especially mm. Ernie and Bird clip. So I, that's another one I can get on Sesame Street's site on YouTube and just get sucked down that rabbit hole really quick as well. Uh-huh. I don't think I've ever seen anything that involves both Jim Henson and Frank Oz that is not absolute gold. Oh my God, just hilarious. And, and just, they know each other so well. 
And uh, when the other one's starting to, you know, sort of like lag, the other one picks it up immediately. They're just, they're absolutely brilliant. I mean, there's a, there's reason that Richard Hunt said it was like watching the modern Abbott and Costello anytime they were together. Yeah. yeah. And I love the idea that most times they were trying to make the other one laugh. Yeah, my instinct is maybe there's some talk show appearances that aren't gold, but then in that case, it's usually the host's fault. So yeah, yeah, the, the, the Dick Cavett piece, I end up, I end up, you know, that's another one. I'll like, I'll click on it just to watch a segment, and I'll end up sitting there for ninety minutes watching that one. Oh yeah, that's yeah. It. that Cavett segment is just brilliant. I do think that there's a few. You mentioned the talk shows. I, I think there's a few things where Jim maybe is a little outclassed by Frank because Frank could be so irreverently funny. And such a powerhouse with what Frank is just like all cylinders firing all the time. Well, it it happens somewhat even on the Cabot appearance. Yeah, right. So, like, you could you could see in a lot of those talk shows where Jim, you know, maybe he's not feeling it that day, or maybe it's just like he's deliberately taking a step back so that Frank can can do his. Although even if you you watch him on like the old car. No, old episodes of Johnny Carson. I, I love the one where I just watched the other day again. He's like got the full on like black leather pants on and stuff like yeah. so so seventy five. Yeah. Um, and, and that's what, but like Jim on his own, like he's not he's not an ad libber really for the most part. Like he's not quite. I mean, he's funny, but he's not quite as quick as somebody like Oz is. Oz just kills. That's right. Uh, yeah, Jim, you can always sort of trying to like think through it as he's doing it. Yeah, I, the, I think also you know we we oh because probably a year ago now we rewatched the. Um, the Tonight Show, where where Kermit guest hosts uh, yeah. for the episode, and um, you know, it's almost like a shame that Jim hosted and not Frank, because Kermit is good; he's very good as the host. Yeah, but Frank, every time Frank, one of Frank's characters is on screen, they're completely taking over the the action. Even just Animal, when they're doing talking to Bernadette Peters, and Animal is just like in the background, and he's just breathing. <laughs> he's just <laughs> grunting yeah, and yeah. panting. Yeah. <laughs> I think in that case, uh, part of it is that Kermit has to sort of be the straight man even more than usual because he has to keep the Tonight Show going, yeah. whereas Frank can just kind of like stand behind him and mess around with the characters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could be true. You, you, but you're right. I think he's deferential enough and appreciates Oz enough to know his strength to let him cut loose. But it's when you see Jim on his own that he he's just you know, and usually he's performing Kermit, who's not inherently a crack up. But he, uh, you know, Jim's not as fast with the one-liner as Frank is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious, Brian, uh, with your work on the book, uh, did you end up with any souvenirs? Um, no. The one, the one thing, I, and I didn't wear it today, um, I do have a really great Kermit the Frog pin. I think I wore it on The Daily Show, even. Um, oh. And I wear it, when I go talk about Jim in public, I always I always wear it. But it's it was they were made just internally. Um, they were molded and you know, like they made the molds and sent them out. And uh, they were they were you know passed around for events. And I was actually given mine by Arthur Novell, who was Jim's publicist. And maybe you guys know Arthur, lovely lovely, mm-hmm. lovely guy. And um, and he actually gave it to me right before uh, the book came out. And he said um, he goes. Jim gave this to me this way. He, like I love Arthur because like he he talks like the, he talks almost like William F. Buckley. <laughs> Jim gave this to me. It was my thirty year pin, and now it's your five. Wow! <laughs> I just loved, and I just so that's one of the things that I have that I just absolutely will never get rid of. It just, it meant so much coming from Arthur, who's sort of the godfather of the book. He's the one that really sort of yeah. you know helped me walk the book through the Henson Company and reach out to the right people, and just a lovely, lovely guy. So that's that's one souvenir that I have. I did put something up on Twitter today. I was looking through some of my files. I actually saved my parking pass from the first time I visited the Henson lot in California. Hmm. Uh, it just has written like you know the date. I think it's like August fourth, uh, three p.m. Uh, contact L Henson. Yeah. But here's one thing I do have. Take this color photocopy. But I, I love this. So this is Jim's passport. Uh, <laughs> it's a photo. It's a photocopy. Oh, wow. It's not the actual passport. But I, because you can't see it, but it, it's got you know 10 million stamps on it from when he was going back and forth between London and New York. Wow. Um, and I just love this. You took a pretty good passport photo. Pass- yeah, not, it's not too bad. But, but when you would open this actual passport, like the accordion page went like, bloop, bloop, like fell out onto the floor because they just kept adding pages in because he was just flying constantly. Um, the other thing I love about this is one of the so one of the things I would ask people when I was when I'd go interview them, I'd always say, "Tell me how tall Jim is." 
and everyone would say, well, he's got to be 6'4", 6'5". And even Oz is like, well, I'm 6'2", so Jim had to be 6'4". Right here on Jim's passport, maybe you can't see it, he self-reports and writes it down, six foot one. Huh. So, uh, so he, he just, he seemed taller to everybody else. So I love that. So, so there, there's Jim self-reporting on his own passport, height six foot one, hair brown, eyes blue. Wow. Yeah, I feel like I usually have heard like six three, six four when yeah, people talk yeah, about how tall he was. He, everybody thought he was huge. And yeah. Like, Power well, I mean, with his, with his reputation, he, I thought he was eight or nine feet tall. Yeah, right. exactly right. So this he is seems one, nine feet tall. One thing I love, but I, that, I want to stress everybody, especially if Karen Falk's watching, this is a color photo copy. It's not the original, but I, I loved this so much, mainly because, too, the page that came out with it just you know hit the floor with just stapled in ad, add-ons and interest. This on the cover is like May 17th, 1978, October 9th, 1976, August 23rd. I mean, it's, it's stamped uh, 150 times in here. It's just fantastic. Wow. Yeah, that's great. I love because that's wow. how busy he was during the Muppet Show. I would love to have a copy of that. On my, I would have a copy of that on my wall if I had an opportunity. That's very, that's very cool, and like it's so niche. I feel like there's only there's, people would see it and appreciate it. Yeah, but like there's so many people in this world who would like really appreciate it on that special level of like yeah, a lot like, of people would just go, hmm, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, yeah right. It's not, yeah, the, exactly. not, it's not the real thing. That's like it's just so cool. <laughs> like his signature here, which is not really the highly stylized Jim Henson logo. That's interesting because it looks like he's kind of getting there. Like it's it's almost the stylized. Signature. Yeah, sort of the big swoosh on the H there, and uh, you know, uh, yeah, trailing off J before he eventually turns it into the logo. But yeah, you know, Walt Disney people are always disappointed. Disney used to actually hand out cards with like the pre-printed autograph because everyone was so disappointed when like, oh. they saw he couldn't actually sign the autograph to look like the logo. Right. That's yeah. Huh. Oh, well, I see uh, Luke Flowers is watching right now. Hello, hey, Luke. Luke. An amazing artist. Hey, uh, recently uh, released a book of um, a Muppet Christmas Carol storybook, uh, which is beautiful. And uh, just announced, which we, we have to write a little thing on topics for, is um, I believe an ABC of Labyrinth book. If I'm oh, not wow. mistaken. Luke, you can cool. tell me if I'm wrong. That's going to be dope. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. That's going to yeah. be great. Uh, all right, so we have uh, just a couple minutes left. Let's see if there's any more questions that really. Um, I, we had another question come in from uh, Dustin Hoff. Uh, could you recount some anecdotes about Jane Henson? I feel like a, a lot of people don't. Uh, you know, she's a little bit un underappreciated, maybe in the the greater Muppet story. <laughs> so Jane was actually one of the first people I interviewed. I sat with her. I think the first time I interviewed her for six hours. Um, my notebook with all the transcription of her interviews, I think, is like this thick. It's just huh. gigantic. Um, so she was the first, you know, first person I sat down with and just really, you know, laid out the history of the company, the history of his life. She was sort of my first person who gave me the outline of Jim's life and their life together. Um, absolutely brilliant woman. Um, you know, there, there's a reason. Well, so, so let me let me back up. So um, after the first draft of the book was complete, I I sent it to the Hensons to read. And I went to go meet Jane after see what she thought. <laughs> and she was sitting, you know, with her arms folded as Jane often did, you know, sort of glaring at me. And she said, you made me sound too damn important. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I said, Jane, uh, you know, I said, I, I've watched your clips. You know, I said, there's a reason he chose you as his first partner. Not before you were his wife, you were his first performing partner. And there's clearly a reason for that. Uh, she's absolutely brilliant. She's a fantastic performer. She's got great instincts. You watch those old Sam and Friends clips and you watch something like I've grown accustomed to her face. Uh, I believe she's performing Yorick in that, but it doesn't matter if she's performing Kermit in that. It's, both are performed brilliantly. She's just absolutely a magnificent performer. Um, so so it was, you know, it was really fun to sort of, you know, have somebody tell her in third person how amazing she was. And you know, and and wasn't always appreciated by Jim, which is one of uh -huh. sort of you know sort of character flaws there. Um, but you know, she was always very um, protective of his work, protective of him. You know, he always came first. Um, you know, worked really hard to make sure that he got the attention he needed, and that he got the support he needed. Just a really, really strong, brilliant, fantastic woman. It was really a privilege to know her, even as sometimes she absolutely scared the crap out of me. Like she's just she really she's she's like Oz. I mean, she's brilliant. She's intimidating. She's not going to suffer fools gladly, and just a really, really, really neat person. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Uh, and then there was one more question here from uh, Erica. I don't I didn't get a last name. Sorry, Erica. Um, asking what sort of things did Jim enjoy uh, when he was by himself? Was he much of a reader? 
Um, what kind of music did he listen to? I would assume that he liked jazz, but uh, I honestly don't know. I don't know that's no, true. Well, that's a great question because Erica, those are the questions I always ask. Um, I always ask, what did Jim like to eat? Um, what did he listen to? What music did he like? And so there's a little there's a little mention of the music in the book at one point because I assumed he was going to be Mr. Jazz, and he he was when he was much younger. They loved he and Jane loved Harry Belafonte, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and he and he had enough of a feel and appreciation of jazz. You can see that kind of stuff showing up in in uh, Sam and Friends, and you know clearly loved uh, Stan Freeberg and that sort of madcap stuff. But as he got a little older, his tastes I think as I described it, his tastes were you know very conventional, sort of top forty. Um, you know, really sort of, you know, really liked, um, um, you, you know, James Taylor, <laughs> the, the sort of mm. sort of serious, the bridge sort of uh, sort of artist, you know, Elton John, things like that. You expect him to be, you know, sunken into the beanbag with that headphones with a long cord on listening to, you know, hard rock or something. And he just really was very mellow was the music he liked. Um, huh. and, and the question I ask everybody, and which is another one I'd love to ask is, you know, what did he like to eat? I always want to know what people people ate. And Everybody always said first thing. Oh my God, dessert! Uh, <laughs> Jim, Jim would Jim ordered dessert all the time, and and I love I love the stories of Jim. You know, asking for the dessert tray to come over and like pointing his finger and asking what everything on the tray is. Absolutely love that dessert. Uh, and I, it, you know, I'd always ask people, what did he eat? And they'd say, well, I don't remember what we had, but I know it was something sweet. So you know, clearly had this reputation of just being the, the dessert fiend. I love that that side of him. He did sort of try to go vegetarian at one point in his life. Um, I don't think it stuck. I think he did it because Cheryl was doing it, um, and he and he went into what everybody sort of called his white phase, where he wore the white suits and the white sneakers and the white pants and drank white wine and ate a lot <laughs> of fish and things like that. But, um, but yeah, I never yeah the dessert was the one thing that everybody to a person uh, identified with him. I remember when when Ryan and I interviewed Frank Oz. I was very curious about his his uh, relationship to media and pop culture. And I remember Ryan, maybe you have a better memory than I do. I think I asked him about what kind of music he liked, and he's like, "I don't know, I don't really listen to music." <laughs> <laughs> well, that what, what kind of movies do you? Right. I asked him what kind of movies do you like. He's like, "I mean, I don't watch too many movies." And then I asked him what was the last movie you saw, and he gave us some like foreign film that no one had ever heard. It, no, it was this international film from maybe five years ago that we had never heard of before, but he was like, Oh yeah, that's my favorite movie from recent years. That's, yeah. yeah. We asked him his favorite movie. Yeah. yeah. I, I like, should, I should track that down though. I should figure out what movie that was where I can see it. I don't think it's a spoiler to say how great was it to see him in Knives Out. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> the movie should have a Frank Oz cameo as far as I know. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, I, we kind of like hit our time here. It kind of flew by, but, uh, Amazing. Yeah, that was uh, that was fantastic. Thank you so much, Brian, for for joining us for this chat. It was a lot of fun. It was very informative. Um, well, this is a great idea, guys. Way to way to keep the content coming while everybody's housebound. This is brilliant. We're working on it. We're working on it. So we're we're gonna try to keep these going. Um, we're talking to a few people uh, about uh, doing one or two of these next week, but uh, no one's on the schedule just yet. So stay tuned on Tough Big Social Media. We will announce who our next guest will be. Excellent. Uh, Brian, uh, where can people find you on the social media? Uh, you can find me mostly on Twitter at Brian J. Jones. Just spell it out like it doesn't cover the book. And I'm always running my mouth over there. So uh, yes. look, for, look, for me, uh, look for me if there. You're looking for something to do to help pass the time until we can all leave the house again, I recommend reading Jim Henson, the biography. Yeah, and it's available uh, as an ebook and an audiobook. And, and, the, yeah, audio, and the audiobook, I will say, is read brilliantly by Mr. Kirby Hayborn. Uh, it's one of those <laughs> books. I always tell everybody, I don't know how gauche it is for you, the author to listen to their own audiobook, but I did listen to Kirby read the book. And I, I actually caught myself sitting in the parking lot when I got to work just listening to him. He's so great at it. And I laughed out loud because I didn't expect it when he does his Lorne Michaels impression in there. I absolutely <laughs> love that. Uh, it's really it a lot of those impression. Yeah, it really, yeah. really reads it brilliantly. So, yeah, great, great stuff. All right, well, thanks again, Brian. Thanks, thank you, everybody. Thanks yes. for your patron say. I thank you, everybody, for letting us get in start late. That was my fault. I was having technical issues. So, here's the thing: it most happens. people are going to be watching this video after the fact anyway, <laughs> so they'll never know that we started late. Now they'll know. I don't know. It was my fault. They didn't know until you said it. Right. I didn't have Chrome. <laughs> didn't have Chrome loaded on my laptop. So. Yeah, we're all good. We're all, good. <laughs> all right. Thanks, hey, everybody. And Ryan, I'm glad you. Uh, I'm glad you were able to get on. Joe and I were talking behind your back about how much we wanted you to join us tonight. So I'm glad. Oh, great. Yeah, I'm, here I am. <laughs> great to be here. It is.